In this module, I'm going to cover some of the miscellaneous small families of Stenorhynchus hemipterans. The psyllids are called jumping plant lice. They're generally small and used to be in one family, the psyllidae. But taxonomists have recently divided them up into five to seven families. The nymphs can be strangely modified so that they look more like scales. Many also induce host plants to make galls, which we'll cover here rather than in the gall module. The phylloxerans and adelgids are quite aphid-like, but they lack cornicles and they tend to be much more flattened. Like aphids, most of these alternate between sexual and asexual forms and they alternate host plants. Many phylloxerans and adelgids also force their host plants to form protective galls. Our first psyllid will be the boxwood psyllid. This pest is found wherever boxwoods are grown. The nymphs emerge from eggs inserted between the leaf bud scales as the buds begin to swell and new leaves begin to emerge in the spring. The tiny green nymphs immediately begin to suck juices out of the mid vein of the leaf shoots which causes the leaves to cup around the nymphs. This distinctive cupping is the most commonly observed symptom of this pest. Unfortunately, once the leaves have been cupped, they will permanently remain cupped. However, if the plants are hardy, subsequent shoot expansion and leaf emergence will cover up the spring damage. The nymphs have wax glands that produce long threads of white wax, but the nymphs also excrete a honeydew that can get caught in the cup leaves and promote fungal growth. The adults begin to emerge in late May into mid-June. They look like tiny green cicadas with segmented antennae. The nymphs have an annoying habit of landing on people walking by boxwoods and they will occasionally probe the skin that produces a sharp pinprick sensation. Adults insert eggs into bud tissues over a couple of months. There is only one generation per season. As previously stated, many of the psyllids produce galls, and the hackberry nipple gall psyllid is one of the most common gall-making species. Where southern hackberry trees are grown, they will have galls. The galls are bladder-shaped, rising from the undersurface of the leaves. There can be dozens of galls on one hackberry leaf. The adults overwinter in leaf litter near their host trees. When the leaves are about half expanded, the adults find their way to the leaves and stems, feed, mate, and lay eggs on the leaves. The first instar nymphs begin to feed on the expanding leaf tissues, and they inject chemicals that start a proliferation of leaf cells to form a bladder. The nymphs remain inside the bladder, which also forms a flap over its opening. The nymphs undergo several molts, and by midsummer they emerge and molt into the winged adults. The winged adults feed on leaves and stems, but at the arrival of cooler weather in the fall, they seek hiding places. Unfortunately, they can invade homes where they can be a nuisance invader. Hackberry trees appear to have four to six species of psyllids that make galls on the leaves and leaf stems. All are best identified by the unique galls that they make as the adults can look much alike other than their sizes. In fact, people shy away from hackberry as a landscape tree because it's rare for the trees to have nicely expanded foliage. However, the trees and gall making psyllids seem to be well adapted to each other and the growth of the hackberry continues without much stunting. In fact, Hackberry trees are quite hardy, and if they can be grown along the edge of the landscape where they don't overhang sidewalks or benches, they can be an excellent choice for a landscape tree. A couple of decades ago, coneflower and black-eyed Susan plants began displaying purple blotches on the leaves. Initially, plant growers were wondering if a new leaf spot disease had been imported. But upon looking on the leaf undersurfaces, it became evident that a scale-like insect was feeding within the discolored and domed tissues. This turned out to be a psyllid. The adults are brightly colored with dark pink and white markings. The adults remain on the plants for some time after the nymphs have finished their development in early June. 
It is assumed that the adults eventually insert eggs into the coneflower stems to overwinter. There is only one generation and the purple blotches are usually covered as new leaves expand over the summer. In the past, adelgids were called aphids, but they are now recognized as being very different than aphids. The wing forms only have five antennal segments. The sexual males have four segmented antennae, and the sexual females have only three segments. The winged forms also have reduced wing veins. All have complicated life cycles that use conifers as hosts. The hemlock woolly adelgid is an invasive species that seems to have lost the alternate host part of its life cycle here in North America. This pest can kill hemlocks in forests and landscapes if not managed. It is easily spotted as the overwintering nymphs mature in the spring and the females produce distinctive waxy cottony ovisacs. These are easily spotted on the underside of branches and needles. In landscapes, this pest is easily controlled with a single application of a systemic insecticide applied when the nymphs are actively feeding. However, control in forest situations is too expensive, so biological controls have been imported to help with management in those locations. The hemlock woolly adelgid overwinters as a partially mature, asexual female. In March, this female finishes her development and begins producing eggs that are contained inside a mass of cottony wax. By late April, these eggs hatch and the nymphs of the progredians generations settle at the bases of last year's needles. They insert their mouth parts and rapidly undergo several instars. When these reach maturity, they will be winged or alates. The wing forms depart to look for their Japanese spruce host, but since this isn't available, they all die. The wingless forms that remain on the hemlock and produce a small cluster of eggs. These eggs hatch into the cistins generation. Cistins is Latin for halt, because the nymphs that settle on the new hemlock growth enter a long summer diapause, that is, an estivation period. Their development resumes in late September into October and development slowly progresses until the following spring. Because of the estivation period, spring treatments with systemics are the most effective. The balsam woolly adelgid is another invasive, this time from Europe. In Europe, it alternates between a fir and a spruce. But since the required spruce is not present in North America, this pest completes its life cycles on firs. Balsam and Fraser firs are the trees most severely affected. In North America, the insect overwinters as a partially mature nymph attached to thin bark of the tree or on new branches. In the spring, this nymph molts into the adult which begins to cover herself with waxy filaments in which eggs are deposited. When the eggs hatch, the tiny first and star nymphs are called crawlers. These don't feed, but quickly need to find a place where they can insert their mouth parts to begin feeding. Once settled, the crawlers molt into the feeding nymph form. This cycle can be completed several times during the summer months and no sexual forms are being produced. Fraser and balsam fir trees react to the feeding of this insect by producing excessively distorted tissues that can result in gouty growth of the branches and extremely brittle branches. This makes the trees unsuitable for Christmas trees or holiday greenery. Continual attack can eventually clog the tree's vascular system that results in tree death. This is another adelgid that has abandoned its habit of alternating between two hosts. This pest is usually a major pest of white pine that has thinner bark, but it is also often found on scotch pine in nurseries. This insect quickly covers its body with white waxy threads that can appear like some kind of fungus growing on the tree trunk or bark. Healthy trees rarely suffer much from this pest but stress trees can often succumb and die. This pest overwinters as partially mature nymphs that develop into asexual females in late March into mid-April. 
These females lay batches of eggs and the new nymphs also settle on the bark and branches. These nymphs can develop into winged or wingless forms. The winged forms can fly in search of new plants where they lay eggs and start an infestation. There appear to be three to five generations in a season. I probably should have started with this adelgid as it is a native species that retains the classic adelgid life cycle that alternates between two conifer species. It forms a gall on Colorado spruce, its native host, but it will also attack Engelmann and Sitka spruces. On spruce, the adelgid cause the base of the needles of a newly expanded shoot to expand laterally until they touch the adjacent needle bases. This forms an eighth of an inch chamber at the bases of the needles, and the adelgids complete their spring development within these chambers. In July, the gold branch dies and the tissues dry, which opens the chambers for the mature nymphs to emerge and immediately molt into winged adults. These then migrate to Douglas fir trees. On Douglas fir, there are two types of adelgids, new migrants that have come from spruce and continuously cycling adelgids. The continuously cycling adults are the most damaging as they overwinter at the bases of the buds as immature females. As the buds begin to swell, these females quickly mature and begin to produce a large mass of white waxy filaments into which eggs are laid. Just as the bud sheath drops off and the newly expanding needles are exposed, the eggs hatch and the crawlers settle onto the needles to feed. Their feeding can cause needle distortion and yellow spots to occur. It is only this generation that causes the needle distortion. The nymphs undergo several instars and eventually produce waxy filaments in which eggs are deposited again. Later in the season, winged females are produced and these can migrate back to the spruce trees. This graphic nicely demonstrates the Cooley spruce gall adelgid cycles on the two hosts. I've described the gall forming generation on spruce and the asexual cycling on Douglas fir, but I left out the aphid-like sexual cycle. This one occurs when winged migrants fly from Douglas fir needles to spruce trees. Here, these females lay two types of eggs that will develop into sexual males and females. These mate and the females will lay an egg that hatches into the asexual female that overwinters and then initiates the gall the following spring. The eastern spruce gall adelgid also produces galls on spruces, but these galls are small pineapple shaped structures formed at the bases of an expanding shoot. This pest is most common on Norway, white and red spruces. It only rarely attacks Colorado spruce. This species also has given up all aspects of using an alternate host. It overwinters as partially mature females at the bases of buds. Like the Cooley spruce gull adelgid, the females finish development as the buds swell and they lay eggs in a cottony, waxy mass. These females initiate the gall and the new nymphs force the plant to complete the galls. The nymphs develop within the gall chambers and finish their development from July into September. When the galls open, the mature nymphs move to the needle tips where they molt into wing forms. But these remain on the needles and lay eggs within waxy filament bundles. When these eggs hatch, the nymphs search for the bases of buds to begin feeding and overwintering until the next spring. Our next insect is a phylloxerin. The phylloxerins used to be in a subfamily of aphids, but they are now a distinct group of their own attributes. Like the adelgids, these evolved to have extremely complicated life cycles, and their body plan has continued to become modified. While most aphids have six segmented antennae, phylloxerans have only three segments. The wing forms also hold the wings flat over the body and the wing venation is even further reduced. The hickory leaf stem gall phylloxerin is still generally called the leaf stem gall aphid. 
This species overwinters its eggs attached to cracks and crevices of hickory trees. In early spring, just as leaf buds are elongating, the eggs hatch and the wingless stem mothers move to the leaf stems and start feeding. Their feeding stimulates growth of a bladder-shaped gall which soon surrounds the stem mother. Unlike aphid stem mothers, she lays several hundred to a thousand eggs inside the gall, and these hatch out into nymphs whose feeding stimulates the gall to keep expanding. These take about a month to mature, and at which time the gall tissues begin to crack open. The new adults, all female, emerge with functioning wings. Many will disperse, but most will remain on the tree settling on the leaves. Here they produce a few eggs. These eggs hatch into a sexual male and female form that mate and the female generally attaches a single egg onto the trunks of the host's hickory trees. Actually, there are several gall-forming phylloxerans that attack hickory and pecan in North America. However, the most important species worldwide has been the grape phylloxeran. This species appears to be a native of North America, and native grapes are well adapted to tolerate it. However, European viniferous grapes react badly, especially to the root infesting stages. Some claim that there can be up to 18 different forms of this insect, all of which occur on grape. But they occur as leaf galling forms and root feeding forms with asexual and sexual forms thrown in the mix. This insect has been spread around the world and is one of the most damaging pests of grape production. About the only effective way to manage this pest is to grow grapes on resistant rootstocks. Here is a condensed chart of the grape phylloxerans life cycle. At the top of the chart, notice that fertilized eggs overwinter on the bark of grape canes. These hatch in the spring into asexual stem mothers when new grape leaves are emerging. They settle on leaf surfaces and begin to feed, which causes a pouch gall to form. This gall is usually covered with hair-like spikes. Here, the female lays eggs that hatch into asexual females that can also lay more eggs. Eventually, some of the hatching nymphs exit the galls and form new galls, or they may crawl down to the root system. Here, they continue an asexual cycle. Their feeding on the roots cause extreme distortions and gall-like structures in which the phylloxerans lay eggs and grow asexually. In the fall, some of the root forms emerge with wings and disperse or remain on the same plant. These lay small and large eggs. These hatch into sexual males and females, respectively. After these finish development, they mate and the female produces a single egg that is attached to the grape canes.